Hi, so here we're going to read Dog Song, Part 1, The Trance, Chapter 1. And it begins with a poem. I came into the world. On both sides there were cliffs. White cliffs were my mother's thighs. And I didn't cry, though it was cold, by the white cliffs, and I was afraid. I came wet into the world. An old Eskimo man, Eskimo man relating the memory of his birth in a snow house on the sea ice. Russell Suskett rolled out of the bunk and put his feet on the floor and listened in the darkness to the sounds of morning. They were the same sounds he had always heard, sounds he used to listen for. Now in the small government house, 16 by 20, they grated like the ends of a broken bone. He heard his father get up and hack and cough and spit into the stove. His father smoked cigarettes all day, rolled them with Prince Albert tobacco and had one hanging on his lip late into the night. In the mornings, he had to cough the cigarettes up. The sound tore at Russell more than at his father. It meant something that did not belong on the coast of the sea in a small Eskimo village. The coughing came from outside, came from the tobacco, which came from outside, and Russell hated it. After the coughing and spitting, there was the sound of the fire being lit, a sound he used to look forward to as he woke. The rustle of paper and kindling and diesel fuel, which was used to start the wood, the scratch of a match, the flame taking, and the stink of the diesel oil filling the one room. Russell did not like the smell of the diesel oil, but he did not hate it the way he hated his father's coughing in the morning. Russell heard the wind outside, and that was good, except that it carried the sounds of the village waking, which meant the sound of snow machine engines starting up. The snow machines were loud and scared the seals. To 14-year-old Russell, the whine of them above the wind hurt as much as the sound of coughing. He was coming to hate them, too. It was still dark in the house because the village generator hadn't been turned on for the day. The darkness was cut by the light of the oil lamp on the table as his father touched a match to the wick. Flat light filled the room and Russell looked around as he always did. It was a standard government house, a winter house. They would have up to summer fish camps later. But in the winter, they, they came into the village and stayed in the government houses. Boxes is what they are, really, he thought. Boxes to put people in. In one corner, there was a small table with an oilcloth table cover. The cloth was patterned with roses, and Russell did not know why his father had ordered it. There were no women there. Russell's mother had been gone for years, gone with a white trapper. Oof. But his father had liked the roses on the tablecloth and had sent for it. Russell had never seen a rose except on the tablecloth and on television over at the central meeting house where there was a set for watching. He did not think roses were as pretty as the small flowers that came in the tundra in the summer while they were taking salmon from the rivers. But his father liked the roses, and Russell liked his father, so he tried liking the roses. All around the walls were pictures of Jesus. His father loved Jesus more than he loved the roses. When he was young, his father had told him about Jesus, and Russell had listened, but he didn't understand. He supposed the idea was something that came when you got old, the understanding of Jesus. And in the meantime, he looked at all the pictures and wondered what they meant. There was one in which Jesus had thorns on his head, and they were cut into him and making him bleed. Russell had asked his father why Jesus would want to do such a thing. Because he is the Son of God and is meant to suffer for your sins, his father said, which made no sense at all to Russell. The story of Jesus happened so long ago, back in the before time, and Russell couldn't remember doing anything wrong enough to make a man shove thorns into his head. But he said nothing against it. Jesus kept his father from drinking, in some ways, which he did not understand, and that was good. When his father used to drink, things were all bad. And if Jesus kept that out of his life, even if he did it mysteriously, well, that was all right. But he got bored with the pictures around the wall showing Jesus with light in back of him and bleeding and carrying a cross. Even in the tiny bathroom where there was the bucket, there was also a picture of Jesus and another hung over the stove. All the pictures were cut out of religious magazines which people outside had sent his father. Two, I'm sorry, two snow machines went by the house. They were moving fast, too fast to stop in the dark if something jumped out in front of them. Russell winced at the noise. Russell owned a snow machine, owned a motor sled, and he used it. But he didn't like snow machines. 
and used one only because he needed a means to get around and he didn't have any dogs. There are almost no dogs in the village. Just one team owned by old Ugruk. And Ugruk didn't use them, but simply kept them for memories. Russell pulled on his felt duffel slippers and slipped them inside the rubber shoe packs that made up the outer boot. He had slept in his pants and it took only a moment to pull the sh undershirt on a, in a sweater. He stepped out to the food cache in the dark. It was an elevated wooden hut filled with caribou and seal and fish meat. Earlier in the winter, the men and boys of the village had gone back into the hills on snow machines and found a herd of caribou, and they had worked around them with rifles, killing into the center. Russell and his father had taken 12 of them. Some others had killed 20 or more, and they brought the meat back on sledges pulled by the snow machines. Russell used a hatchet to chop off some slivers of caribou and a tiny bit of seal meat. He took them back into the house. On the wood stove was a pan, and he pulled it over onto the heat and threw in the seal and caribou meat. The frozen seal meat started to melt and give off oil immediately, and the caribou began to cook in the oil, and soon the smell of the meat filled the room, and he liked that. He stood looking down at the pan, and when the meat was warm, still nearly raw, he took out a piece of caribou and put it in his mouth and used an ulu, a short curved knife, to cut the meat just on the edge of his lips. He chewed and swallowed, then took another bite, cutting it cleanly, chewing, staring at the stove, the pan, at nothing. You should cook the meat longer, his father said, coming from the bathroom. We do not eat it raw anymore. Russell said nothing, nodded, but took more meat. There are small things in the meat to make you sick, small worms and bugs. When you cook the meat more, it kills them. I was hungry. Well, next time, eh? Russell nodded. Next time. His father watched the meat cook. We used to eat everything raw, but now we have learned to cook it. That's one of the good things we learned. Russell smiled. Raw meat tastes better. You get the blood then. Well, that's true, but you also get the small things to make you sick. It's better to cook it. Yes, father. He wanted to go on and say, Father, I'm not happy with myself, but he did not. I was not the, it was not the sort of thing you talked about, this feeling he had, unless you could find out what was causing it. He did not know enough of the feeling to talk. There were some of the old things that were not bad, his father said. I am too young to remember many of them, but I was told a lot of them by my father. You did not meet him before you were born. He, he died in a bad storm on the sea. His umiak was torn by ice when they were walrus hunting, and all the men in the boat died but one who rode on the ice on a sealskin float. It was an awful thing, an awful thing. The women cut themselves deep and bled in grief when they learned. I was just a small boy, but I remember the grief. His father scratched himself and took some meat, still nearly raw. I like the blood taste too. He bit, cut, and chewed and put the ulu back on the stovetop. Father, something is bothering me. He replied around the meat, I know, I have seen it, but I don't know what it is. I know that too. It is part of you that is 14 and have 13 winters. And there are things that happen then which are hard to understand. But the other part that is bothering you, I cannot say because I lack knowledge. You must get help from some other place. Russell nodded then thought, but where? His father looked at the ceiling, back down thinking, when I have trouble that I do not understand, I sometimes get help from Jesus Christ. Russell hesitated. He did not want to sound discourteous, but he was sure Jesus wouldn't help. But you do not have Jesus so that you may not work for you. If you do not have Jesus, I think you should go and talk to Ugruk. He is old and sometimes wise, and he also tells good stories. Ugruk for help? His father laughed. I know, you think he is old and just babbles, but there are two things there. There are Ugric's words, and there is Ugric's song. Songs and words are not always the same. They do not always say the same thing. Sometimes words lie, but the song is always true. If you listen to Ugric's words, sometimes they don't make sense. But if you listen to his song, there is much to learn from Ugric. All right, I will go. But will Ugric give me a song? Russell had heard about the songs his father spoke of. They were private and belonged only to the person who owned them. Now almost no one had a song. That is for him to know. 
Now go and get more meat. You did not bring enough in. His father thought a moment. And bring in two of the heads so they will begin to thaw. You want the heads? Not for me, for Ugruk. Take the heads when you go as a gift. He loves the eyes. Russell nodded and went out into the dark again.